Good morning, everyone in Tokyo, and good evening, all our friends in New York. I'm Alicia Ogawa. I'm director of the project on Japanese corporate governance and stewardship here on the Center of Japanese Economy and Business. And I always like to remind everyone that the purpose of our program is to uh, exchange best practices from both countries, Japan and the United States, given that both systems are on opposite sides of the spectrum. Perhaps Japan is far to this side in terms of stakeholder capitalism, where the United States is more on the other extreme of shareholder capitalism. And we both have a lot to learn from each other in terms of how we can move closer to the middle. Um, I want to begin by remarking that when um, developed markets began to be an investment destination many years ago, um, market commentators often said that Brazil was a country of tremendous potential and it always would be, meaning that the potential would never be realized. And I sometimes feel that way when we talk about Japan as a value market. Um, what, what is Japan's value as an equity market? So tonight's topic is a very complex and a timely one. It's much more profound than just is the market going to go up. Uh, we need to talk about how are prices set in equity markets. Uh, Mr. Nakajima, one of our speakers, has some very nice slides prepared to help us answer this question. So I'm going to, with your indulgence, make a few comments on a related subject. Uh, I certainly don't want to steal his thunder. But on the one hand, valuations of Japanese equities look very attractive compared to US and European shares. Many analysts have produced work showing that there's very little upside left in US and European markets. And in addition to more compelling equity valuations, the Japanese market has a number of positive trends at the macro level that should catch the attention of global investors who have been, for a long time now, severely underweight Japan equities. For example, share buybacks and more generous dividend payouts in Japan look set to continue, partly generated by a record-breaking level of shareholder activism in Japan. The economy is also benefiting from a renewal of demand from the United States and China as those countries have brought COVID under control. Companies in Japan are beginning very slowly to embrace some parts of the corporate governance code, particularly in terms of improving dialogue with their shareholders and in developing strategies around ESG standards. On the other hand, we see day after day after day evidence of bad behavior and even fraud among companies such as Mitsubishi Electric, Sharp, Toshiba, and Nissan. We also see, I don't want to say questionable behavior, but uh, can I say behavior with lack of transparency by the government and the regulators of these companies, particularly in the case of Toshiba and Nissan. And it's this lack of transparency by the government in their interactions with these companies, which has fed the perception, which is not necessarily justified, but it has fed the perception that Japan is anti-foreign investment. We also have the domination of the Japanese market by two public investors, the Government Pension Investment Fund and the Bank of Japan, institutions who don't exercise their fiduciary duties as investors directly. All of these factors interfere with the natural dynamics of the equity market. Finally, a major and long-standing complaint of institutional investors has been the structure of the Japanese market. Japan is a tale of two markets, they say. On the one hand, you have new and very dynamic companies with world-class products and good management. And on the other hand, you have a far, far greater number of companies who seem to exist only for the sake of their own management teams, who often don't even cover their cost of capital, and who seem tone deaf to the concerns of both their shareholders and their stakeholders. This dichotomy is exacerbated by another unique feature of the Japanese market, which is more money is managed in passive investment funds than in active investment funds. Passive investment funds invest in an automatic conformity to benchmark indices such as topics or Nikkei 225 without any regard to the value of the individual stocks that make up that index. Active investment requires fund managers to identify a number, usually a small number, of specific companies which they regard as good value. Given the prevalence of passive money, the stars of the Japanese companies, those good companies I referred to, 
are, defer, are, de, are deprived of investment that would otherwise reward them with the higher valuations they deserve simply because of the presence of zombie companies in the major stock market, market indices, which suck up money from passive investors. So all of us were excited when the TSE announced that it would attempt to reform the stock market listing rules in order to reduce the unfair prominence given to shareholder unfriendly and overvalued lazy companies. The TSC proposed to create a new section of the stock market, which would be reserved only for those companies whose stocks traded freely, that is where trading liquidity was not limited by extensive cross shareholdings. And the new section of the market would require companies to have stricter governance standards, such as publication of information in English and the requirement that one third of the board should be represented by independent directors it was meant to be reserved only for world-class Japanese companies. This seemed to be a good way to shove the low growth old Japanese companies into a corner and direct investor attention to the more dynamic listed firms. Unfortunately, uh, this approach seems doomed to fail at least in the short run for three reasons. First, the standards for the entry into this new prime section of the market have been watered down substantially from the original plan. Second, companies which are already listed in the first section of the TSC will be automatically grandfathered into the new prime section for a few years, whether they meet the new stricter standards or not. And lastly, there seem to be no plans, at least at, at present, to create a prime index that would drive passive investments away from the broad market index, such as topics, and towards the higher quality companies. One of my SEPA uh, classmates, a friend, who runs a fund in Tokyo, David Barron, he always says, Japanese companies are not broken. It's the market that's broken. So I hope we'll discuss tonight what is the solution if the reform of the TSC is not ambitious enough. Let me throw out a few, dis a few suggestions to debate with our speakers. First, perhaps private equity has an important role to play by moving companies off the exchange, re reorganizing them to be more profitable before listing them as public companies again. Second, why not allow activist investors greater freedom to exercise their shareholder rights in order to promote positive change in the target companies? And thirdly, why not construct market indices that can better direct passive money to higher growth quality companies? So I'm hoping to discuss these with the speakers and other issues as well. So without further ado, let me introduce our two speakers. I'm summarizing their bios for the sake of time, but please, please take, check out the full list of their accomplishments on the website. First up is Mr. Tad Fukushima, who is CIO of BlackRock Japan, and more importantly, is a Columbia Business School graduate. He's got over 30 years of experience as a fund manager. And second, our next speaker will be Mr. Daisuke Nakajima, who is an MD at Evercore, where he's a senior member of the economic research team. He's responsible for producing forecasts on the US and Japanese economy, which must be one of the world's most thankless jobs. Um, I should hasten to add that he's also a Columbia grad. I've asked each of them to give us a five minute introduction after which we will move to a conversation, the three of us. Um, but please feel free to post any questions you have during our discussion for the speakers in the Q&A box. If I can't get to them during the first part of our conversation, I'll be sure to save the, the last at least 15 or 20 minutes of our time to respond to your questions. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mr. Fukushima to make his uh, introduction. Okay, thank you, Alicia, and uh, thank you for a uh, summary of the Japanese market. I'm basically agree with that. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Tad Fukushima, and uh, I work for the BlackRock Japan, uh, the largest non-Japanese as asset managers. Uh, and our main products are global fixed income, global equity, multi-asset strategies, hedge funds, illiquid alternatives. And we provide active, passive, and quantitative strategies for both equity and fixed income uh, income products. 
uh, clients are public and uh, corporate pension funds, financial institu institutions such as mega banks, special finance companies, insurance, and regional banks. Uh, as a CIO, I have uh, five responsibilities. Uh, one is uh, manage the team of portfolio managers and uh, portfolio strategists. Two, I oversight and make sure all the returns and risks are appropriate for the all local managed portfolios. And third, uh, manage a concentrated active Japanese equity portfolio. And uh, four, uh, input the Japanese market insights to the global investors in the farm. And then five, uh, deliver global view of the BlackRock Investment Institute to the local clients and the media. Uh, I am working in the asset management industries uh, since 1987 and then studied Columbia Business School from 89 to 91 to be more competitive in the industry. Uh, in Nikko Asset Management in 1990s, I managed the global equity and global fixed income portfolio for retail clients. And that the Bankers Trust, then Deutsche Bank in late 90s to 2003, I was responsible global, for global equity portfolio. And then as a CIO, asset allocation for many pension clients. At Meiji Asset, asset Management, I was CIO and a turnaround manager for four years. And then finally, I joined the Black Lock Japan in 2016. Uh, I'm not like other Japanese professionals. I never experienced an internal job rotation, uh, but stay in the investment and the research department for entire my career. Uh, I have experience from both global and domestic market, equity and fixing income products and the developed markets and the emerging market and liquid and in liquid hedge funds. It's back to you, Aisha. So um, let me just ask you a quick question. You were at Columbia B School from 1987 to 1991. Is that what you said? Uh, 89 to 91. 89 to 91. Well, that is going um, to, that, so that takes away some of my questions because it seems like you missed the most exciting or treacherous time in the yen equity market, which is just before the bubble exploded. Uh, maybe that was a, a good thing that you missed that. I don't know. But uh, it would be interesting to hear you talk about that at some other point. So I'm now going to turn it over to Mr. Daisuke Nakajima to give his introduction for five minutes. Thank you, Alicia. And uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. I uh, really appreciate your time. Uh, I'm an economist and managing director here at Evercore ISI. Um, I wear two hats in the economic research department. As Alicia said, I, I'm a senior economist covering the US economy, but I'm also the lead economist and strategist for Japan. Uh, being based in New York, um, I always sort of view, because I cover both economies, I view Japan and Japanese market in the context of the global uh, economy and financial markets. Uh, I myself grew up in Tokyo, but I've been in the US now over 20 plus years. and. I started my career at the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago as an economist. So a lot of what I'll be talking about um, is coming from an economist's point of view, uh, but obviously with respect to uh, investing in equities. Uh, just a little bit about Evercore. Evercore is a global investment bank focusing on three businesses, um, investment banking, advisory, uh, institutional equities, which is where I belong, and wealth management. And in terms of clients and investors that I interact with on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, I have my team pull up, but 85% of investors uh, that Evercore covers are in the US and Canada. So 85% North America, 10% uh, in Europe, and then 5% in Asia, uh, which includes Japan. So, you know, I, I think my views are quite shaped by US-centric um, group of investors, uh, but I am in constant contact with investors in, in the New York area, in the US in general. Uh, I closely monitor their investor sentiment on fin global financial markets, but that also gives me a clue as to how Japan fits into their investment decision making process. So that's just sort of my background on who I speak to most. Um, 
pre-COVID days, you know, because I cover Japan, but I'm covering it out of New York City, uh, that was actually one of the disadvantages is I'm, I'm here, uh, not in Tokyo. So pre-COVID days, what I, what I used to do is I go to Japan uh, once a quarter, and I would meet with about 30 companies, 30 public companies each quarter, and I would do a survey. Uh, of these companies. So I have a set of 20 questions that I always ask every quarter about their CapEx plans, their business plans, their sales expectations, uh, pricing plans, wage plans. Uh, we also talk about capital allocation. Uh, so that has, you know, over, I think the past 10 years, I've, I must have met at least 200 companies. Uh, and of course, during the survey period, we would talk about corporate governance and capital allocation, which you know go hand in hand. Uh, some of which I will discuss um, today. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to lead off with a very general question for you both. Maybe Tad, I'll ask you to respond first. But um, it, you know, in my experience in yen equity markets going back to the 1980s, it seemed to me that um, foreign investors always perceive Japan as a relative value play. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen a global general asset manager allocate money to Japan because he thought it was a growth market, right? But with every cycle from the bubble era, the last big move we saw into equities was Mr. Abe uh, announcing Abenomics. It seems that the strength of the wave going into Japan gets weaker and weaker. Somebody who's on this call, I won't name, uh, said to me that he feels a little bit despairing that Japan is becoming kind of irrelevant to global investors because it takes so much time to, 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 to follow Japan. It's not very transparent. Uh, you don't get very clear answers and you can make a lot of money in other markets. So I, I share that concern. I don't want Japan to become irrelevant. Can you tell us briefly, what is the attitude of your investors, uh, foreign investors, but maybe domestic investors as well, towards the Japanese market given we have both these positive trends that I mentioned and the negative trends in the market. Um, what's the, how does this all add up, Tad? Well, it's, it's uh, the Japanese market, it's uh, something like a peripheral market is now. And uh, in APAC, people are more focused on the China rather than Japan. Uh, so uh, your comment is, uh, is well taken. Uh, like today's news, uh, Nikkei newspaper report that for the first half of this year from mutual fund, Japanese retail investor invest in a global uh, equity mutual fund for 4 trillion yen, but they actually uh, sold 170 billion uh, Japanese yen from the uh, Japanese equity. So uh, I think our uh, retail market is a client of uh, quite interested in the global market and then not so much in the Japanese equity markets. And for the corporate pensions funds, and there are now exposure for the Japanese equities average 9%, they're more interested to enhance the returns by investing in the alternatives, not by increasing the Japanese equities. So we are limited uh, demand from domestic uh, markets. For our global uh, clients, uh, I think there are two types. One is uh, taking Japan as an opportunistic asset, as a cyclical play. And uh, last week, we, we upgraded Japanese equity from underway to neutral uh, for globally. That is because of the uh, late cycle catch-up plays, not really a fundamental change or a good governance or a, 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 a uh, good strategy, those kind of things. And uh, uh, we expect to see that some inflow from those, you know, cyclic, uh, the investors who want the cyclical play. The another type is the long-term investors, particularly the Europeans uh, who are interested in the fundamentals. They are quite interested in the enhancement of the Japanese corporate governance and the ESGs. Uh, I think Japan has not convinced the case for these long-term investors. It's in working process. Mm. Back to you. Uh, 
Well, when you talk about the domestic institutional investors being looking at alternative assets because they need yield, that seems to be the case here in America and in Europe as well, that long-term investors are very wary of certainly fixed income, but even global equities. So that makes sense. But retail investors in Japan uh, have always, or certainly since the 1970s, have been anti-Japanese equities, right? They always prefer to look outside their country, which is quite strange and at odds with retail markets in the other, other parts of the world. What do you think needs to happen for retail investors in Japan to become more enthusiastic about their own market? Well, actually, the uh, Japanese equity market doesn't have so much stats like uh, uh, fund companies. And then um, there are some growth companies, but not so shiny like the US growth companies. So, but from time to time, Japanese investors, particularly the, the net investors are interested in the growth companies, more small size growth companies are uh, listed in the mother's market. Mm. So uh, if we see that uh, continuous growth in the leading companies such as Sony and the Hitachi, and they they are, they revalue uh, the the market values are revalued, and then probably are the Japanese uh, retail investors are interested in, but they have a bad experience of the churning in the past. Mm. So uh, I think that we can encourage the the investors through the net, but very difficult to to attract for the traditional uh, mutual fund clients. How important is the, I don't know how to say this, but the newer investors who love day trading or apps trading or, op well, you don't have options trading in Japan really, but uh, how important are these people who are always on Twitter and, you know, very aggressive trader? Are, do they make a difference? Are they numerous? Uh, I think uh, the number of accounts increased by 10% compared to the before the COVID. Mm -hmm. And then um, uh, maybe they uh, uh, contribute to some to the liquidity. But at the same time, also when the market has uh, correction, uh, they will be the one to buy it. So it's kind of small automatic stabilizers role they can play that. That's interesting. That's very mm -hmm. interesting. I didn't know that. Um, Daisuke, could I ask you to answer this question about is Japan irrelevant? Uh, what do the investors that you deal with feel about Japan? What would make them more feel that it was a more compelling case to enter Japan? Um, and one of our um, one of the questions from our audience is, uh, let me see if I can find. Oh, right, it's from a Mr. Ito. Um, is there a bubble in the United States? And is there a bubble in Japan? Uh, and would the, the existence of such bubbles drive flows one way or the other? Do you see that? But first, let's yeah. go about the, what you see yeah. in investors' attitude towards Japan. Yeah, let me uh, start with investment uh, investors' sentiment in general. So uh, I don't think anybody's aggressively negative on Japan. I don't, at least I don't know of anybody. And you sort of touched on this, which is I think we're still in an early phase of a multi-year global economic expansion. And that's the type of environment where Japanese uh, equities do very well in. So this is not an environment where you want to be shorting Japan. Um, and I don't know of anybody who's short Japan. I think the reality is actually worse than that, which is people are just uninterested and not following Japan. I think you sort of mentioned that earlier uh, in your remark. Um, I find that to be a troublesome uh, backdrop, especially amongst the New York and, and the U.S. Invest, uh, investor client base, they just don't seem to be paying attention to what's happening in Japan, whether it's corporate governance or the corporate scandals, you know, positive or negative, people don't seem to be responding to the market. So I find that quite troublesome. And um, I want to share a few slides that I prepare, but when I, you know, I talked to maybe 12 um, investors that I'm close to. And I said, look, I'm doing this webinar for CJAM, you know, tell me very honestly, why, you know, why is your fund underweight Japan? Why are you or why are global investors generally not interested in Japan? And, you know, I heard back 10 interesting comments, but I picked out, you know, I took the liberty of picking the two best ones. So I just want to introduce uh, 
a couple of these comments, I think they're more interesting than, than my uh, ideas. So let me do this. I think you can see this, the screen now. So this, I, I think this one wins the best comment um, that I collected. So Japan's return to volatility profile is inferior to, to other options. Put differently, global investors do not receive adequate compensation for risk of investing in Japanese equities. So risk reward is just not there, not attractive enough. Yeah, can I interrupt you with a question? Sure, so sure. Do you, to what do you uh, attribute the greater volatility? I mean, one is liquidity, right? Liquidity is a key issue for many listed companies and that's why the TSC is doing this reform, right? Uh, are there other issues that, that uh, contribute to um, higher volatility relative to return in your view? I mean, part of it is just structural, right? I mean, there there isn't much you could do um, just just because the manufacturing sector is so important in Japan. Hmm. Um, it is just uh, by design more cyclical and more volatile ah, than the right. U.S. market. So, you know, unless we have an economic transformation of Japan, you can't really fix that. Hmm. But the problem here is this. So you know, this is what I prepared. And so on the left-hand side is the return side and the right-hand side is the risk part, right? So, you know, over the last 20 years, if you invested in the S&P, you've, you know, returns are 230%. So you tripled your money in 20, 20 years. If you look at Japan, it's not bad. I mean, you've doubled your money in 20 years. It's not, it's not bad by any means. It's actually the second best performing market uh, just after the US, Europe hasn't done this this well. The problem is when you start to think about the risk, because mm -hmm. you have to think about the trade off between returns and risk. Now, over the last 20 years, Japan has had eight corrections of 10% or more versus the S&P of seven times. So, you know, they're sort of in the same ballpark, but Japan has had one more correction. But if you look at okay, what happens during bear markets, right? And if you look at the right-hand side, uh, Japanese markets tend to decline much more or sometimes more than the US. So if you're taking a risk, you should be compensated for with higher returns, which in this case, Japan is not doing that over the last 20 years. So if there's one thing that you know, I want to leave you with tonight from my, my end is it, it's, it's this, it's that the, the return uh, versus volatility or risk reward isn't just attractive enough for global investors to find Japan appealing. And the second uh, point I want to make, and I thought this was a pretty good point too, I heard, I heard this from a portfolio manager in Connecticut, uh, the reason why global investors don't find Japan um, interesting is it's pretty simple, not enough capital return, right? The major difference is U.S. corporates are much more aggressive in capital deployments, which could lead to faster um, earnings growth or better returns. Um, so here's that little table that I did. Japan has an enormous amount of corporate cash, which I think is a great thing if they were to put that to use, right? So they have $3 trillion in on the balance sheet, the U.S. is pretty close, uh, but of course the U.S. market size is much bigger. So normalized to the size of the market, Japan has about five times more uh, of cash uh, sitting on the balance sheet that could be deployed uh, to uh, shareholders via dividends or share buybacks. So. I'm, I don't think I'm saying anything that's sort of groundbreaking. I think everybody on this call is probably aware. Uh, they've read about it uh, in the newspaper and in various articles. But these are really their honest answers as to why they don't find Japan appealing is I am willing to take a risk, but if I'm taking that risk, I want to be compensated for it. And investors are simply, they haven't been compensated in the last 20 years. Yeah, um, I want to, before I throw a question to Tad that I haven't prepared him for, <laughs> I want to go back to something that you said. You said that um, you, know, you find that global investors often are unaware of what's going on in Japan, even with the big corporate scandals or the big um, regulatory moves like the TSC reform or corporate governance code. And I, I want to say that, um, you know, there's a terrific terrifically limited 
amount of information in English on either regulatory developments or even company news. Um, research departments in Tokyo, since I worked there, have been completely eviscerated. You know, there are very few analysts compared to what there used to be. Uh, I think there's something like, uh, I think I, 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 the last time I looked, you know, analysts are covering, you know, less than half, less than half of the TSC one listed companies. Uh, and very few of those analysts speak really good English. So, uh, and then finally, even the major US newspapers really don't have much coverage of Japan. I mean, there's one major US newspaper I can think of, happens to be located in New York, that really hasn't written anything about Toshiba. And so how can you blame the people that you're talking to for not knowing much about Japan? I guess what I'm trying to say is for anybody in the audience in Japan who is either a regulator or who runs a securities company, you need to get more information for non-Japanese speakers out into the market if you want the Japanese equity market to, um, to, to, to flourish. I, I don't think there's any way you can expect global asset allocators who don't speak Japanese to have a good understanding of what's going on. I don't think it's their fault. And it's a chicken and egg, right? If you can't, if you don't have any information, then you're not even going to try. Um, is that, do, am, I, am I saying something crazy? Daisuke? <laughs> no, I don't, I, don't, I don't think so. Um... I'll tell you one thing from the macro perspective as to why people have started to tune out of Japan is at least from a macro perspective, right? Let's think about what used to move equity markets in Japan. It's the Bank of Japan monetary uh, stimulus uh, and to a certain extent fiscal stimulus and then corporate governance. So th that's a structural story. Um, I think it's widely perceived that the Bank of Japan is out of ammo you know, they, they, there just isn't much more left for the Bank of Japan to do. So, you know, all the macro trades, whether it's the currency side or, or rates, um, they, they're just not there. Um, yeah. And then if you think about fiscal, uh, it, it never really moved the, the equity market as much as monetary uh, mm -hmm. because fiscal uh, stimulus tends to be incremental in Japan. So mm -hmm. again, you, you are losing investors here. And then corporate governance, I don't want to go too deep, too deep into this at this point, but um, it does feel like the momentum has, um, at least from the New York perspective, at least the momentum seems to have slowed down a little bit in the last two, three years. So you think about all three things that used to drive the, the Japanese market the last five years or you know five to eight years, they're simply just not there today. Yeah, one of the people I work for um, on the fixed income side says watching Japanese monetary policy is not like watching paint dry. It's like watching dried paint. <laughs> Something to that. Uh, yeah. can, I, can I go back to you? Um, I'm going to throw this question from, it's from somebody in our audience. Uh, Mr. Allen asks, because I think this is an interesting question. He asks, why is Warren Buffett investing in large cap Japanese companies? And I remember, you know, back in the early 90s, there was a lot of Japanese people would say, if only Warren Buffett would come to Japan, if only he would come to Japan, that would start, you know, that would be the beginning of a great re-rating of the Japanese market. Well, he came to Japan and he made big investments and it hardly even made the newspaper. <laughs> I mean, the, and I'm talking about the Japanese newspapers. So what was that all about and what does it mean from your point of view? It can be your personal point of view. I don't expect BlackRock has something to say about this. Well, uh, it was uh, quite the news when the Buffett invested in a major trading for trading companies uh, with the PAE is uh, quite low, maybe single digit seven, eight times and a good uh, dividend yield. And the good thing about the trading companies, they're more entrepreneurs relative to the other Japanese companies. So it was interesting, but that's kind of value play. And uh, well, uh, the, the problems of Japanese, you know, uh, the people are not interested in the Japanese market is that we have a, a 
good coverage. Basically, like uh, the BlackRock Global Equity investors know about the Japanese company, but uh, their focus is, you know, the handful of the good companies such as uh, Nidec or Recruit or Sony. And it's very hard to find a domestic players uh, who are more competitive, globally competitive domestic players in like a retail or real estate or banks. If you want to you know, invest in the banks or real estate or the retailers, you may choose the Europeans or maybe Chinese or the US. So we only have a good companies, the machinery or electronics, but not so much in the other areas. So that's the issue of the Japanese uh, market. In other words, the index is weak. Uh, maybe 20, 30 percent of the large companies are globally competitive and the good management. Uh, they're more proactive in the governance, but the less of them are reactive or maybe a little bit sleepy. And then there is no sign of improvement of the uh, uh, return on capital employed. So this uh, two-tier market. And the problem, problem is, you know, if, if it's 50-50, it's fine, but uh, the good companies my view is land 20 to 30 uh, companies in a large cap. So that's uh, maybe the challenge Japanese equity market has now. Oh, I, I couldn't agree with you more. However, I think there is an additional problem from my point of view. Tell me if you agree that you do have a lot of companies in Japan that make the best or maybe they are the only company making a little component that the top three companies in the world use, right? And so they are critical. We find that out time and time again when there are accidents that disrupt the supply chain, right? But those companies, as you say, they're swimming in this huge Japanese public equity market that includes a lot of these sleepy com companies. That's one problem. The second problem is, in my opinion, Japanese companies are not boastful enough. They're too shy. They don't really know how to communicate their strengths to the outside world. Do you think that's fair? Uh, yes and no. Uh, actually, the many more companies are willing to uh, talk about uh, their strategy because of the uh, they have to engage with the stakeholder, uh, stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So uh, they are more uh, uh, provocative about the return on equity and the return on investment capital. That's, uh, I see, the good development. But again, that's not really the majority. It, it, the number is increased, but still there is a quiet companies. It's so not shy, just a quiet. Yeah. yeah. So it sounds like you are part of a group that is not, um, too optimistic about the reforms of the Tokyo Stock Exchange in terms of the ability to separate the good companies from the lazy companies. Do you think that the reforms will make that happen over a long time or do they need to be more aggressive or what is your opinion about the effects of the TSC reform? I support the reform, but uh, I think it's not bold enough because it's, a, I think, series of compromise. Uh, I wanted to see that uh, threshold for the market cap is 50 billion yen, but actually it's uh, maybe 280, and then floating share is the 10, 10 billion yen, which is uh, quite small. The uh, average size of the company is uh, quite small relative to the S&P 500 or stocks uh, 600 in Europe. So we want to you know, see more strict uh, the threshold for the market cap. Uh, one thing I would like to appreciate that change is that uh, they don't include uh, to the floating share but cross cross holding. So actually, the company has to disentangle uh, the web of cross holding, which is uh, good for the uh, corporate governance. Yeah, I, I've had one fund manager say to me that the TSC reform is not really revolutionary, but uh, many companies have been <clears throat> thinking about doing mergers or sales of subsidiaries or sales of cross shareholdings. And this reform is making them do it now as opposed to just continuing to think about it. Yeah. 
But the problem is, uh, according to the Nikkei, maybe 660 yeah. companies cannot join. You know, it's out of 2,200 uh, companies. Mm -hmm. uh, two, more than 200 it's, uh, sounds like many, but actually only 1% of the market value. Mm -hmm. So the impact is not material at all. Yes, I understand that. So then let's have a discussion, both you and, and Daisuke. Uh, maybe I can ask Daisuke first. So if this TSC reform is at least in the first iteration, maybe it will get more strict, but in the first iteration, as uh, Tad points out, isn't really going to have that much of an effect. Where else can we look to um, separate the wheat from the chaff, to direct money into the good companies and away from the bad companies? So the first question I would ask is about, is PE a solution? Um, if PE companies take these, these uh, lazy companies private and restructure them to create more value and then relist them, is that a good strategy? I, I would hasten to say that PE these days seems to be rather a toxic subject. Anybody who reads the FT these days will see about how concerned the UK government is about the quote unquote predatory nature of PE companies in, in the UK because they tend to take on a lot of debt, interest rates now are very low, what happens when interest rates go up? So let me ask you first, uh, Daisuke, do you think that PE would be a good solution right now to this problem we're discussing? I think my short answer is yes, but let me, let me sort of build on that. I th I'm a firm believer that um, the more um, active participation by any group of investors, um, that's better for the Japanese equity market. Right? So it doesn't matter if you're short term or long term or hedge funds or pension funds or uh, PEs or activist funds or passive funds, the more investors you have in the, in the market, it's ultimately better for Japan. Uh, so I would say PE is one solution or one part of a solution to uh, the problem. Uh, one thing that I think uh, PEs can offer uh, that I think is critical for Japan's structural uh, side of it is industry consolidation. Mm -hmm. um, so if you, you know, again, if you look at why are returns low in Japan, again, structurally, right, why are returns low in Japan, uh, one of the reasons has to be because margins are lower in Japan, just structurally, right? So again, here, I, I prepare some slide that kind of shows that, uh, but um, here is, I'm going to give credit where it's due, here's corporate uh, profit margins in Japan. So they were you know, trending, averaging about two and a half percent for 40, 50 years. And then when Mr. Abe came in and corporate governance um, got, uh, got a push, uh, margins actually improved. They went all the way up to 7%. Uh, so I'm going to give credit uh, where it's due. Margins have improved over the past decade. Now, the problem is if you go to the next slide, right, compared to that to the US or even Europe, um, margins in Japan are still lower, much lower than, and, than um, the U.S. or Europe. Now, part of the problem here is, I think, overcompetition in Japan. Uh, so one, one thing, one trivia that I picked out that I find very interesting is, did you know that there are more restaurants in Japan than all of the United States? <laughs> When you mean it's restaurants, you mean individual individual eating establishments, restaurants okay. and bars, which is insane for the land size of Japan to have more restaurants than than all of the United States. But that's just one example where it shows over competition, and of course, you know, over com over competition is one of the reasons why margins are low. Right, you you just can't sustain. Um, uh, period of margin expansion in that in that kind of environment. So one solution to that is consolidation, industry consolidation, right? You have to have fewer number of players in every industry possible. Now, one bottleneck of that is if you can't, you know, let's say you merge company A and B, the problem is you can't let go of employees, right? So you can't gain productivity. Again, this, this goes back to what you said earlier, 
uh, the U.S. may be overdoing uh, in that respect. Uh, mm -hmm. But it is part of the uh, sort of necessary adjustment that needs to be made after uh, mergers and acquisitions. And Japan simply does not have that uh, the, the infrastructure that can facilitate MA, right? So that's something uh, that could be fixed, um, that could be addressed, but that's not being addressed at the moment. Mm. Um, Tad, how do you respond to that, to both the MA market and the idea that PE could help um, get some of the lazy companies that are taking capital out of the market out of the way to let smaller companies prosper? Um, yeah, and about um, Daisuke's comment about uh, labor, uh, I'd like to ask you to comment on what I'm about to say. For me, I've always thought the one key um, impediment to better governance in Japan is that there's no liquid labor market. If you can't hire the best person for the job, how can you be globally competitive? So again, the main question is, can PE, can mergers uh, serve to help um, divert money into high growth companies in Japan and improve the valuations in the Japanese stock market? Actually, PE is helping a large uh, corporations uh, consolidations or uh, uh, and the reforms, and then maybe activists will support those sleepy smaller companies, which has a uh, lots of cashes. So the world's largest private equity firm like Apollo, uh, Bain, Blackstone, KKR, all have their local presence now, and uh, anticipating the post-pandemic surge of non-core assets disposable, and the restructuring in Japan. And uh, actually, they raise a lot of money. And uh, for example, Hitachi uh, spin off the no core assets, and there's a merger and acquisition of the soft banks and consolidation listed subsidiary, NTT Bota, NTT Tokum. We have uh, so many activities in large corporations, which is good for Japan. And then also, uh, uh, the activist is really uh, attacking the sleepy uh, uh, management companies who has a uh, lots of cash, which is also a wake up call for uh, the Japanese uh, mid cap uh, companies. Well, uh, as Daisuke said, the problem is the low, pro low productivity in the small or mid sized companies in Japan, where well, Germany has uh, also smaller mid sized but their profit margins are much higher than Japan. Even in Japanese, maybe one reason is they have too many companies. The other reason is they have the, uh, the technology, but they don't have the passing, passing power. They are just a subcontractor, so their margins are always better at the large corporation. So those are mid small uh, companies have to be consolidated. Mm -hmm. And also it's interesting, if you compare the uh, global companies uh, in, in Tokyo, uh, Japan branch, and in the same industry, Japanese companies, always global companies had higher productivity. So if the global companies acquire the Japanese, uh, Japanese companies, then the productivity will be improved. So uh, the Japanese companies actually need some kind of the outside pressure or internal pressure to much, but maybe it will take time, but uh, in that sense, the activist is a quite important lord in my, uh, in my view. Yeah. I, 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 of course, I agree with you. As you know, I'm deeply involved with activists in Japan. But what um, kind of my, my, my observation is always that there are multiple activists now uh, in smaller cap companies. It's not unusual to find three activists in some small cap company. But yet the major global activists, the biggest activist funds, the most global ones, you see very rarely in Japan. Because for those kinds of companies, they can't fool around with some little tiny company in Nagoya. They have to take on one of the big conglomerates. And there's all kinds of reasons why they don't do that. It seems very legally risky. It doesn't seem like the government is gonna stand aside and let you do what you wanna do, right? Um, and in terms of um, obstacles to overcome like cross shareholdings and banking relationships. So I agree with you that activism is a very, very powerful force for good when we talk about small and mid cap companies. But unfortunately, you see very little of that positive energy directed at the biggest, laziest companies. I hope that changes, but 
doesn't seem like it will. We have a couple this, of, um, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I was gonna say this sort of fits into, you know, what one of the investors said about risk reward on Japan, right? Activism is a extremely costly way of investing in yes, terms of is. time and capital and research that needs to be done. I mean, it, it, it is a very capital and labor intensive process. Now, if you're an activist fund, you're gonna be asking yourself, is this worth my time and money to go after this project? And you know, the track record in Japan is not quite supportive of that, right? How many activist um, funds have done ex really well in Japan? And the short answer is their time is probably spent someplace else or uh, maybe in the US or in Europe. Um, that's, yeah. So again, it goes back to that risk reward yeah, calculus. So small, small activist funds that are focused solely on Japan and solely on small cap companies, some of them have done phenomenally well, but the bigger companies that need to take on bigger targets, you're right. They've either been completely absent or not very successful. Um, so there are a couple of really interesting questions from the audience. Ted, can I go back to you because you seem to be familiar with the um, private equity market. Um, David Backlett from Cambridge Associates was asking a question about what is the state of the secondary market for Japan uh, private equity transactions? Because if you don't have a secondary market, then all of the ambitions of these big players like KKR and Bain and Carlyle, et cetera, uh, you know, again, it, it just makes their lives more difficult. It makes it more difficult for them to, to exit, right? Yes, but uh, uh, there are many uh, buyers and sellers of the uh, private equity markets. Once you know they turn around the uh, companies, so there are many Japanese competitors or uh, uh, the same industry group would like to buy that. So I think you don't have to go through the uh, IPO market, but there are many uh, buyers. Uh, they would like to uh, increase, you know, uh, uh, by just buying the company. So I think uh, there is a lot of the uh, exits for the private equities. Do you know if there is something happening in Japan that there is here in the United States? If you are a high net worth person, you can buy uh, into a fund that just has little pieces of secondary P transactions, right? So a Newberger Berman will buy something and chop it up into little pieces and sell it off to high net worth individuals. Is that, is that happening in Japan yet? It's, yes, it's happening. Actually, we have the private equity fund uh, and then the part of that is selling to the high net worth through the uh, uh, distributor. Got it, that's interesting. Thank you very much. Um, there is a question from uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Shin Ito, who asks, what are the opportunities? We haven't talked about governance. So maybe I'll start off with you, Ted. He says, what opportunities are there? Uh, oh, sorry, it's not his question. It's somebody else's question. What opportunities are there for ethics and governance experts to serve on Japanese boards under the new corporate governance codes, which require new independent directors? Uh, I, I know what I would answer, but how would you answer that question? Uh, I, maybe I would like to hear your answer first. And <laughs> I, yeah. um, I guess my answer is um, the role of the independent director in Japan is a very new role, right? It didn't really exist even 10 years ago. And so what is expected of an independent director and how the chairman and the CEO uh, should use the independent directors. I think many companies are still figuring this out. Uh, and there aren't very many governance specialists, uh, apart from some academics, um, to fill those seats. And so I guess the answer I would give to this person yeah. is, there are plenty of opportunities, but there's not that much supply. Yes, uh, actually, if you have a, a very a competitive, good CEOs, the uh, non presidential uh, board director's role is monitoring. Mm. But actually, the Japanese board is uh, basically the same kind of people and then a little bit lack of diversities. So uh, many companies need uh, some advice from the uh, non residential uh, board of directors. So we prefer to uh, see the ex-managers or uh, management people rather than 
academics or lawyers uh, mm -hmm. and those things. And they I, we would like to see the substance of those peoples. So, uh, but if the Jap uh, if the system is matured, uh, their role is more monitoring and and rather than advising, but I, still in a, a working in process stage. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to argue with you because I've interviewed, I don't know, I think something like 51 independent directors in Japan and some who join boards who have experienced not as managers, some, not many, but some really get engaged inside the company and try to promote better work practices or try to enfranchise the women workers or try to uh, make connections with shareholders. So I think, you know, if you have a CEO who allows that or encourages that, you know, I think, I think that's how a board becomes a better board. There are some boards I know of where the people on the board are highly qualified and maybe there are even some diversity there, but if all they do is look at the numbers, that's not really contributing to the future of the company. Yeah, actually many of the company has a reserved seat for the uh, non residential board, because if you uh, retire from this uh, group of the company, there's always the seat. And that right. kind of one is just a formality. It's, yeah. it's not substance. So you really have to distinguish when you talk about, you engage to the companies. Yeah. Um, now I want to ask, uh, come back to something that Daisuke said. I, I think we have only uh, four minutes left. Uh, well, here, let, let's throw you this, the, 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 the quick question. Somebody from the audience, I knew, I think we have two questions about this, wants to ask both of you, what do you think is the impact of the Olympics on the stock market, short term, medium term? Will it be a positive? Will it be a negative? Let's make this a short answer. Uh, I think there's no impact now <laughs> whatsoever, short, short term, long term. I mean, long term, I guess it was bad that we couldn't showcase, Japan couldn't showcase um, some of the technology that it was planning to show. Uh, but in the short term, I think it was already discounted in the market. Um, I'll share something with you then that maybe uh, makes you think. Um, I talked to uh, an economist in Tokyo last night who showed me survey data of the Olympics in the 1960s. And popular opinion was against it then because it was felt that it would be too polluting. You know, Japan was just beginning, you know, to deal with, with its emergence as an industrial nation. So who knows? But, but no, I, I, I tend to agree with you. <laughs> Tad, what do you think? Or uh, I think no impact. And the Japanese, comp uh, Japanese markets are more focused on uh, uh, the uh, vac uh, vac vaccinations and then also the strong demand from uh, uh, global manufacturers. So those are the important things. And uh, uh, we think that uh, this year's learning will up around 25 to 30% and next year is around 15%. So I think uh, those are the more important for the Japanese market. Okay. Um, I'm going to throw the last question to our economist here on the screen. Um, I, I, I'm not sure I can. Oh, it's Mr. Allison, Don Allison. He says he wants to ask about inflation. Um, it, it's hard to imagine that inflation picks up significantly in Japan on a sustained basis. Uh, but the Federal Reserve, as you know, is, is an active debate here about what's going on. Uh, if inflation did move up to two or three percent, couldn't this give a huge lift to Japanese equities, especially Japanese banks, uh, retail and other investors would want to reduce their fixed income investments um, to increase equity allocations. Do you have, do you, how do you handicap that probability? Yeah, I mean, I think inflation is in Japan is something I call like a unicorn. <laughs> Everybody dreams of it, but you just <laughs> haven't seen it in the last 20 years. And my expectation is I don't uh, expect to see it. Um, it for a long time. And I think it's, a lot of it is structural, not cyclical. Um, if we're talking about cyclical, we're, I think we agree that we're going to have some spectacular economic growth in Japan and overseas. So you should help that. You, that should help inflation. But I think a lot of the inflationary problems are structural in Japan. So what does that mean? Um, yields, interest rates will continue to be low in Japan. Um, that should actually be good for equity 
market, right? Uh, valuation wise. And also it's great for PE firms to come, continue to come to Japan. Um, so I see both sides. I mean, if you were to have inflation pick up to two, that helps earnings power. But on the other side of it is equities are, again, it's my favorite fra uh, phrase, Tina, there's no alternative. And <laughs> equities should win in that environment. Yeah. Can I ask, I, I don't ask you to comment on uh, actions undertaken by the Bank of Japan, but do you think that when foreign investors look at the market that the the ownership of equities in Japan by the Bank of Japan is something that concerns them? Um, concern, yes. Um, mostly as to how they're going to unwind yeah. this yeah. tool. Yeah. Um, just in terms of market function and uh, function, I think at least the initial part of the equity ETF purchases was it had the right idea, mm. which is to make sure you support risk premium, right? Make sure the market functions as it should. Uh, I think the problem is it became too big and the program went on for too long to the point where the Bank of Japan was buying, you know, to your point, they were buying great companies, but also not so great companies, right? right. So right. how do you, um, how do you uh, adjust price uh, if right. they were buying everything? So I think that impeded uh, market function. I'm going to give the last word to Tad. Do you have any comment on uh, either the Bank of Japan or any other structural impediments in the Japanese market that um, we might hope would disappear and make the market more efficient? What, in uh, your view, what would be the best? Yeah, my, I think the uh, BOJ is basically a start a state of stapling. I don't think that the BOJ will buy the ETF further, maybe just a little one or two times when the market really, really plunged. So maybe internally they are start discussing how to uh, uh, reduce their holding, but it's politically very difficult to go through the market. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the fixed income side, the JGBs, they already start tapering and they just buy very, very small amount. Uh, but uh, uh, thanks to the yield curve control, the market is basically died. It doesn't move at <laughs> all. all. So there are lots of the uh, Japanese uh, bond traders and the salespeople lost the job. So I hope it won't happen to the equity market. <laughs> <laughs> That's so bad, uh -huh. Well, um, I think we are just one minute over. So it only remains for me to thank you both, uh, Tad and Daisuke. Thank you so much for being so generous with your time. Uh, I hope our audience learned as much as I did and it was a really enjoyable and interesting discussion. So thank you very much. Hope to see you again soon, people in the audience and hope to see you too, um, Daisuke and, and Tad. Thank you for joining us. And uh, it just remains now for me to thank our corporate sponsors, who I always like to say, uh, not only support us uh, financially, which we certainly appreciate, but they also are good friends. They, uh, they encourage us with research um, uh, topics we should study and, 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 and make suggestions to us, which is also very helpful. I also don't want to forget to thank, thank the CJEB staff. People who uh, attend webinars and people who speak at webinars know how often there's technical glitches, and I don't think we've ever had one, so I want to make sure I thank them as well. Thank you all for participating. Thanks again to our sponsors and hope you have a good evening if you're in New York and a good day if you're in Japan. Thanks again.